Right, well, uh, everybody, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's great to see such a wonderful turnout here in the Sir Harold Raggett Theatre. Uh, may I please remind you to put your mobile phones on silent uh, for uh, the duration of the seminar. Uh, my name is Carol Chanotta. I'm the Senior Science Advisor of the Exploring for the Future program. Uh, and the program is the home for the work that we're going to see showcased today uh, in the presentation. Uh, I want to begin by emphasising that Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continued connection to land, water, sky and community. We pay our respect to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present and today we are meeting on Nanawal and Nambri country. Uh, the speakers for today are Phil Main and Evgeny Bastrikov. I will present on the power of legacy sample collections from archives to cutting edge geochemical and min mineralogical data. Uh, and what we're going to see is how that unlocks new information and stimulates, uh, I suppose, exploration of their applications. Our first speaker, Phil Main, um, uh, uh, will uh, discuss the fresh uh, data insights from past geochemical surveys in Cape York. Phil graduated from the University of Queensland with a Bachelor of Science with honours before starting at Geoscience Australia in 2014 as part of the graduate program. Uh, he then uh, has worked on the Southern Thompson Geochemical Survey and the Northern Australian Geochemical Survey and more recently has been working on the Level Geochemical Baseline of Australia project um, aimed at producing a seamless data set using Geoscience Australia's large data holdings of surface geochemical data. Then we'll hear from uh, Dr Evgeny Bastrikov uh, who will talk about the first ever continental heavy mineral data set and atlas uh, delivered from the National Geochemical Survey of Australia samples. Evgeny graduated from Moscow State University with a Master of Science and received his doctorate from ANU. He joined Geoscience Australia in 1997 and worked on multiple economic geology projects, including low gold, IOCG, uranium, porphyry, copper gold lead and salt lake mineral systems, and then turned his attention to geochemical uh, project. His main contribution to the Exploring for the Future program was designing and managing the Northern Australia Geochemical Survey and more recently uh, the heavy mineral map of Australia and specifically the tools uh, surrounding it. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Phil Main to come to the podium and uh, present at the first part of the seminar. All right, thanks for the introduction, Carol. Um, so as Carol just mentioned, we're going to be talking about archive samples and in particular we're going to be talking about um, surface sediment archive samples, so none of that hard rock nonsense. Um, the slides actually change, there we go. Um, so to start with, I'll be talking about the level of geochemical baseline of Australia, and then Evgeny is going to follow up with the heavy mineral map of Australia. I'd just like to acknowledge that both of these projects were funded as part of Geoscience Australia's Exploring for the Future program. So I'd really like to start with why we undertake surface geochemistry. There's two main reasons that we uh, undertake surveys here at Geoscience Australia. The more uh, impactful, obvious one is through tenement uptake uh, from mineral exploration companies and opening new uh, search place for different mineral systems. So we've got a, a map here uh, based on tenement uptake for the Northern Australia Geochemical Survey. So this was collected back in 2017 and then released in 2018. So we've had a good few years now for the impact we felt and people to discover the data set. And as we've seen, um, we've had about 75,000 square kilometers of tenement uptake based on the back of this geochemical data. Um, some of it is purely based on the geochemical survey. Others um, are from multidisciplinary data sets that release as part of programs such as Exporn for the Future program. So it's this combination of geochemical surveys with other data sets that really uh, drives this impact. So the green uh, areas there are the tenements that have been uptaken as part of NAGS, and you look at an area the size of the Czech Republic. So it's not a small area that's being taken up. Now the heavy mineral map of Australia, which Evgeny will talk about, has only released recently, but it's also seen some strong tenement uptake across the country with nearly 5,000 square kilometers of tenements taken up. Now the less tangible thing is uh, the data provided by these geochemical surveys provides invaluable information about the geology of Australia, as well as information about the geochemical environmental baseline across Australia as well. So that's to say, we can map any changes in the geochemistry through time if necessary and can go back potentially to revisit some of these areas and see changes through time. 
So that's the, I guess, the subtle bit that you don't often see, but is really powerful. So a bit of background on, I guess, our history of collecting surface sediment geochemistry samples here at Geoscience Australia and our predecessor organizations. So it all started in the 1940s, um, but this was very different to the kind of surveys we undertake now. Um, the Bureau of Mineral Resources, as it was at the time, really focused on deposit scale geochemistry. So that is literally looking at a sediment or a stream right above a known mineral deposit, looking at the three or four elements of interest and really targeting that very local area. Now, it wasn't until the 1960s that we actually started regional scale programs. Uh, these regional scale programs, again, very different to what we undertake today, very high density, uh, limited number of analyses in a lot of cases. Um, they were really focused on initially direct detection of mineral systems, so focused on lead, zinc, copper. You often only have a handful of elements presented with them. Before moving into the 90s, where we start to see more of that looking at the geological background as well. Now we had a bit of a hiatus um, until the early 2000s where we kind of recommenced regional surveys, but they were very different. And so driven by Patrice de Caratat, we had a change from stream sediment survey into more overbank low density surveys, which as you'll see later, have just as much impact, if not more impact than some of these high density surveys that have been collected in the past. Now, all of this work really culminated in the National Geochemical Survey of Australia, which is a fundamental geochemical data set that covers the majority of the country. So a really key data set there. And then we move into, I guess, some of the later stuff, uh, which I mentioned earlier, the Northern Australia Geochemical Survey. And then more recently, and this large amount of reanalyzed data, and then the level geochemical baseline of Australia. So these historic surveys can be difficult to use in some cases. Um, in some cases, they're not in our database. They don't have location information. And what you get is an old report, if you're lucky, that has a map such as this in this super high quality. Um, often they are hand drawn. And this is all the information you get to try and locate your samples. You get a couple of streams, you know, two roads, the Stuart Highway, which may or may not have moved in that time. Um, so it's really a challenge to try and locate some of these samples to find out where they are. Thankfully, the modern stuff actually has GPS, so it's a bit easier. And as I mentioned before, a lot of these older surveys, particularly those pre-1990s, really have a limited number of analyses. Um, some in the 60s have maybe eight with them, and you maybe get up to 20 to 30 as you get towards the 1990s, which is very different to the 60 plus that we regularly analyze today. The other issue with this older data is there was no quality information reported in the initial reports, which means we have all this data, but we have no way of knowing if it's any good. Um, there's no standards, uh, very little information about analytical techniques. So whilst we have the data, we don't know how usable it is and how useful it is. But it's really powerful. A lot of these surveys have been collected in areas that would now be inaccessible, um, cost prohibitive to get into, or have actually been developed. Some places have um, housing developments over them now, so we'd never be able to collect the information that we would be able to get from these archive samples. Now, as I mentioned, we had a kind of fundamental shift in the early 2000s with how we collected surface sediment geochemistry data. We moved to overbank sampling and ultra low densities. Um, so this is the map of uh, the National Geochemical Survey of Australia and the current extent of it. Now, these have one sample representing approximately 5,500 square kilometers. Now, as you'll see a bit later, this is ultra low density compared to these historic surveys. We do do some higher density surveys, such as NAGS, uh, which was one sample for 500 square kilometers. But we're still talking a large area represented by a single point. Um, but the power of these surveys is we're still seeing strong tenement uptake. We're able to acquire these samples relatively quickly and easily. In the case of NAGS, this was acquired over approximately a two month period. So we're rapidly able to acquire these data sets and put them together, um, which is, I guess, some of the powers of these ultra low density samples instead of traipsing around up a stream and trying to collect it. Now, I guess in towards the more global context, um, a lot of other countries and regions have national and continental scale uh, geochemical surveys. Um, the two examples here are GBASE from the UK and Forges, which covers Europe. 
Now these data sets have been collected over multiple years, um, but they had one thing in mind, which was they knew they were going to be collecting these over time. So the surveys were designed in a way that they could actually continuously add in the new data as it was collected. That's not something we've historically done here. A lot of our surveys have been collected individually for that one purpose, and then we move on to the next area. And that's something we're hoping to change. Um, but by reanalyzing this data, we can now start to add it in and also provide new insights. Um, as new mineral systems open up, critical minerals has become a big thing. A lot of these minerals um, and the elements that make them up weren't actually analyzed, so we couldn't open up any search space for them. But now we're reanalyzing them. Uh, we're looking at these elements that we otherwise wouldn't have. So we're providing new insights into existing areas as well. Now, it might sound like it's somewhat trivial to kind of put all this geochemical data together and just produce a nice, pretty map. It's not quite that simple. Um, so here I've got an example from the Southern Thompson Origin um, Geochemical Survey. This was collected in two separate time periods. So the initial samples were these orange dots down in New South Wales here. And then there was a follow-up survey um, up into mainly Queensland, represented by the blue dots. Now, same sampling methodologies, same analytical techniques. Everything was pretty much identical. All of it passed rigorous QAQC. There was nothing untowards in any of the data. Um, however, when we start to look at this data um, with more statistical tools, in this case, um, principal component analysis, um, so that is a dimensionality reduction tool. It allows us to take the 60 plus elements that we analyze and look at the variance in the data through groupings of data, uh, through groupings of the elements in this case, which we refer to as principal components for this particular data set. So um, one group of elements together explains X amount of data. Um, the most data is explained by principal component one, and then we explain less and less data as we go down the principal components. So if we look at the cross plot of principal component one versus principal component two, uh, we can actually see that the majority of the variance within the data set is actually being explained by the survey that they were collected as part of. Uh, we can see a distinct separation um, on this plot through here of the two survey lines. So we need to address this. Um, this starts to come out as you use more of these statistical tools to look at the data and you start to see splits and boundaries um, based on the data. This was um, a more cryptic case of it. Some of the older surveys, you can see distinct steps between different map sheets and areas. Um, but through leveling, we're able to correct some of these variations. And this is purely from the fact that they're analyzed on different analytical machines. It's purely that difference in the fundamental machine and the drift as it's analyzing the data that causes these subtle differences. But once we level the data, we've been able to remove the majority of that analytical variation, which means we're able to actually examine the data uh, a lot more closely with these more advanced statistical tools. And in the case of other data sets, actually remove the step changes between map sheets. So we knew it was possible to do with the data that we had. So we launched a pilot project focused on the North Australia Kraton. Um, so in this area, we started with the NAGS data set, which had been recently acquired at the time and then looked at all the other surveys that were in our database at the time. And what we did was we took approximately 10 samples from each of the older surveys and reanalyzed them in order to use them um, for leveling. But what we didn't do was analyze the whole suite. So we were left with these historic results. We had somewhat of a proxy for quality through to how um, they were responding to the new results, but we still had the old accuracies, precisions, and detection limits, and some unknowns on the data as well. Um, but we produced a seamless data set. We were able to produce a machine learning map of copper across the region, which didn't have any step changes or differences based on the survey boundaries. So we knew it was possible. We knew we could do it. It was time to roll it out across the country. But before we get there, I'd just like to quickly brush up on what we do for leveling. I've talked about it a few times now, so I should really cover what we do. For a lot of surveys, if you design them with leveling in mind, it's it's not trivial, but it's a lot easier. You've planned for it in advance. You can design your survey around it. When we've got these historic surveys and um, the surveys we've been collecting up until recently, as I said, they're designed to be used by themselves in a single area, which means we're somewhat limited into what we can actually do to level them. Thankfully, we have a few different methods that we can employ. Uh, the first one, which I just mentioned, is reanalysis. Um, so this is these two plots here as the example. So we take a handful 
preferably 10 or more samples, reanalyze them, and put them in a cross plot, do the linear regression for them to see what kind of uh, correction we need to do to bring that line back to the one-to-one. -one. Um, now, obviously, there is still some scattering in the data, but there's nothing we can really do to address that, but it at least brings the data back to the one-to-one -one line. Another option is to use the standards that we run with our geochemical data. Um, so this bottom plot here um, shows the distributions uh, for a single standard that was run in over two different surveys. And as you can see, there are two very distinct populations there. So what we can do is we can create a correction factor between the two to level one to the other. Or in the case of certified reference materials, which have known values, we can bring both of those to the reference value so it's a single point. Now, the downside of using just a single standard, it's a single point in the range of concentrations. Uh, it's great if the lines are parallel, but if you start to get perpendicular lines, um, lines such as these, if your correction is done down here, you're not going to correct fully up towards the top end here. You're going to get some variation as it changes up the concentration range. Um, to address this, if we're fortunate enough to have multiple standards that are across um, the surveys, then we can use the median of each of these and then use the linear regression to produce our correction factor. And this gives us the power of being able to actually look at a range of concentration ranges and correct for these slopes where they're not exactly parallel. So, the level geochemical baseline. We knew that we didn't have all of our data within the database. We'd had a few requests um, from people asking for old data that we had to go find that wasn't in our database. So we knew they were out there. So we undertook a rigorous um, literature review of all the old BMR and XR, and in some cases the GA literature, to try and find what surveys had been undertaken. It wasn't an easy task. A lot of the surveys were actually reported in old progress reports, and that was the only real reference to them. So you had to go digging from there. Um, once we'd identified all the surveys that we could, we only selected those prior to the year 2000 to be reanalyzed to modern analytical standards. Post 2000, they have rigorous QAQC information presented with them. Um, there's a larger range of analytes. So thank you, Patrice, for actually reporting your standards in that. It's made life a lot easier. Um, and it wasn't actually possible to actually locate physical samples for all of them, though. Um, so those from the 1960s, really difficult to find. And this is mainly because they suffer from non-unique sample numbers. So it's really hard to find sample number one with all the other sample number ones that are down in the repository. Um, sometimes it's possible if you're lucky, they labeled the box with the survey, um, but it's pretty difficult to find them. They may be down there, but it'd probably take a significant concerted effort to try and find them. Others, we had missing samples. Um, sometimes they show up. We've had some extra boxes of, data, of samples appear that we've been able to reanalyze. Um, but a lot of them are just not available. The archive amounts were pretty low to start with, only a few grams of some of these, so it may be that they're exhausted and they're no longer available. Others, we have the samples. We don't have the documentation around them. Um, we know there was a Tantangra survey, so for the Brindabellas, we have the samples in-house. We don't have the locations for them. So it's areas like that where potentially in the future we'll be able to add some of our historic things, but it starts to be an increasing amount of effort to try and add these things in. But still, we've added in nearly 9,000 new reanalysis data points, so it's a significant amount of data still. And to go back to these historic surveys, so the red dots on this um, diagram here, this is one of the really bad areas. It's um, in the Georgetown, Cape York area, and a lot of those are just missing. We've been un unable to locate them. We are able to use the historic data. Because we have samples across all of these survey areas, we can use these reanalyzed results to level in the old data to still get some element concentrations across some of these areas. But as I mentioned, these are really high density. So we range from approximately one sample per square kilometer up to about one sample per 10 to 15 square kilometers. When you compare that to NAGS or NGSA at 500 or 5,500 square kilometers, it's a significant scale increase. So there's a lot of value in these data sets and a lot of information that they can provide. So because of the value of such data, uh, we wanted to ensure that it was actually of high quality and usable for decades into the future. Um, so all the samples were analyzed by the same laboratory over three main time periods. 
We analyze for total contents uh, for a suite of 63 elements, which is kind of the standard range that we undertake uh, these days. But we also undertook rigorous QAQC. We didn't want to come back 20 years from now and somebody come up to me and say, why didn't you check this data properly? What were you thinking? So uh, we ran one duplicate every 10 samples, and that's to check for the homogeneity of the material we're actually analyzing. Uh, we, we ran either a certified reference material, those with a actual known value, or an internal project stem standard. Um, this is a material that we've had made up that is hopefully homogeneous and can be reproducible, but it allows us to insert at a high rate. And all of these were inserted one every 10 samples. So this allows us to check one drift through time of the machine as well as any bias in the data. And finally, we included a quartz blank every 50 to 100 samples to check for contamination in the data as well. And then the analytical laboratory also analyzed repeats of each of the samples periodically as well to check the quality on their end as well. So thankfully, all the data came in excellent. Um, the majority of the elements were deemed uh, more than suitable for use. A handful were deemed unsuitable, um, but these elements are typically difficult to analyze or at very low concentration levels. Uh, so it's difficult to get any actual information from the standards because they're all near detection limits. So things such as silver or cadmium, um, whilst presented in the data set, they are asterisked as a did not pass quality check. So for all of our reanalyzed data for all 9,000 points, we've produced a map for every single element. So if you're interested in looking at a lot of maps, we have a lot of maps for you. Um, each one of them is classified based on two keys exploration principles. So uh, box plot distributions of each of the points across the survey area or map sheets in a lot of cases. Um, and then overlaying onto a creep background to really aid in interpretation. Some areas, such as Cape York, there's a lot of data. There's nearly 6,000 samples across the Cape York, Georgetown area. If you try to plot them as a single thing, all you end up with is one black blob of points. So it's not really usable. So we split these up into the individual map sheets. So if you want to use them together, the data is all there. You can look at it in ArcGIS and have a play to your heart's content. But for these map products, we've split them up so you can actually view the data. So I guess what some of you are here for, the initial results from this reanalyzed data. Um, so the data has only just been released, but we've been able to have some cursory looks at the data. In this case, we're looking at the Cape York Georgetown region, this large data set of nearly 6,000 samples. Um, so this is actually composed of surveys over multiple generations. So we're able to now, through leveling, actually view all this data together as a seamless product. And there is some significant concentrations of rare earth elements in this data set, um, talking up to 31,000 parts per million in the light rare earths and 5,500 parts per million in the heavy rare earths. It's, it's almost at the level you could go out to some of these streams and get a bucket and go sell it. It's that high. Um, now, these high concentration values were originally present in the original data, but to a much lower extent. Um, in some cases, it was only up to one or 2,000 ppm where actually we're seeing 30,000. And that was as we discovered due to a calibration issue with the original data. So by rerunning this data and having standards with it, we're able to you know, ensure that we have this high quality data and we're somewhat confident in the results we're getting, but also gain new value in um, these data sets as well. So interestingly, the, some of these rare earth results are correlated with Silurian age uh, granites and granodiorites. Um, so in this particular example, I've got the White Springs granodiorite, so this blob in pink here. Um, and that has some high concentrations of heavy rough elements, nearly 4,000 parts per million coming off some of the streams, but it's highly localized. So whilst we're not sure what the processes are, it's not entirely related to the larger um, Silurian Age granites and granodiorite suites themselves. There's definitely some local processes going on. Otherwise, we would see high concentrations level across this entire area. So either it's a local process, either through concentrations in the stream, or we've got um, concentrations of the rare earth elements through veining or um, something else happening there. Now, very recently hot off the press, um, driven by Patrice and Evgeny, uh, they actually reanalyzed the NGSA archive uh, for lithium uh, for total contents. This was a key gap in the original data set, which is becoming increasingly important as we transition to net zero and the demand for critical minerals increases. So 
The NGSA is a fundamental data set. In the case of the level geochemical baseline, it acts as a backbone. It links all of those regional surveys together um, to provide that information across the rest of the country. Um, unfortunately, we still do have a gap in the NGSA. Um, it'd be great to fill that in and try and finally finish off uh, the national products, but this is where we are now. So the NGSA is now even more comprehensive as a data set and really useful for looking at the broad trends across the country. So where are we currently up to? Well, the level geochemical baseline of Australia is currently composed of approximately 12,000 samples. Um, as you can see, based on these green dots, they're mostly in Northern Australia. It turns out that uh, a lot of the old BMR and exo scientists really love to go up north, not sure why. Um, but that's what we have. We have some data from down in Canberra and then some from Northern New South Wales. So it'd be really great to add in some data from South Australia and WA, and again, fill in that hole to really complete the picture across the country. Now, as I mentioned, um, we do have some internal project standards. We actually made a, a fair amount of these. Um, my stipulation was I want enough to see me through to retirement. Um, so we have a good amount available, which means that we can add it into new surveys, which is, allows us to easily level them in. But it also means if anyone else is running a regional survey, we can potentially give them some of this standard so they can level it in to really maximize the value of this data. So, just to conclude, surface geochemistry can be a really powerful tool to assess um, mineral exploration, but it can also be useful to set environmental geochemical baselines. I know I haven't talked about it much today, but I've kind of run out of time. Um, archive samples are a really cost-effective way of gaining new insights into regions. Um, as we've seen in uptick of critical minerals, providing these um, fundamental geochemical data sets should really help in opening up new terrain. Um, and it would be incredibly cost prohibitive to collect sample, samples at these densities today. Um, it would also be difficult to get in to some of the regions and I don't think most people would be happy about me digging into their house to try and get a sample to where some of them are as well. So, coming soon, the Level Geochemical Baseline data release and report will be released shortly. Um, the reanalyzed data is out there now for you to play with. Um, so that's that top DOI link there. Um, don't worry if you don't catch these, you can feel free to send me an email and I can point you in the direction. We've also got the released NGSA lithium data set, and I've also included the Python code um, for leveling the geochemical data, as well as our QAQC code as well. So if you're ever looking at large amounts of geochemical data and you want to quickly provide some QAQC, um, feel free to use that code. Now, you've heard from me about, I guess, more traditional approaches to using archive sample, which is looking at the geochemistry. Now we're going to hear from Evgeny about something a bit more novel. Okay, Phil, thank you for the smooth transition. First of all, I want to emphasize that I'm delivering this talk on behalf of the whole HMMA uh, team. To some extent, uh, I'm just a messenger. So it was a very successful uh, collaborative project between uh, Geoscience Science Australia and Curtin University. It worked surprisingly smoothly and everyone was very happy with it. So the project concept, uh, it actually belongs to Patrice Decretat in uh, collaboration with uh, Brent McKinnis. All the heavy analytical lifting was completed by Alex Walker from Curtin Uni who supervised uh, sample preparation analysis itself and QAQC and interpretation of the data in terms of uh, mineral compositions. Uh, my role was uh, data analysis and visualization and Phil was uh, uh, responsible for production of the final atlas that incorporates uh, more than 800 uh, maps of heavy minerals. So the background, what are heavy minerals? Uh, uh, so normally we classify them if they have a density more than 2.9 grams per cubic centimeter. For comparison, uh, average uh, density of crustal minerals will be 2.5 to 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, they are normally very resistant to mechanical and uh, chemical weathering, and as a result, they can uh, survive uh, long traveling distances and times uh, in a rock weathering uh, cycle and uh, transportation of sediments. Uh, normally they are quite diagnostic of 
geological environment of their origin. For example, we can uh, speak about uh, metamorphic grades or alteration styles, uh, or their source rock compositions. Uh, and they are routinely used for mineral exploration. Uh, they can also be used for correlation and provenance studies as well. Uh, the application was uh, extremely um, successful in Canada, where they basically provided people with the opportunity to look through glacial uh, till, uh, looking for mineral deposits. So the mineral systems that can be identified with heavy minerals are quite diverse. They include gold, diamond, mineral sands, nickel copper, PG elements, uh, VMS, non-sulfide zinc, porphyry copper deposits, basically, you name it, almost all type of mineral systems. And there are big uh, proprietary, uh, big companies, the uh, HMA, heavy minerals uh, sample data sets uh, held in Australia, but none of them, uh, none of this data is uh, in uh, public domain. So basically when EFTF started and uh, there was an opportunity to get funding for such a project, uh, it was very actually tempting to fill in this uh, gap uh, and to see what we'll have as a result. So first of all, the vision was to check whether we can use existing archive samples, namely NJSA, to extract, identify, and quantify heavy minerals. Uh, the next question was uh, whether it could be done in automated and cost-effective way to cover the whole continent uh, within a three-year project. We also wanted uh, to check what kind of benefits it, would, uh, it could bring to industry, academia, and government stakeholders. As I mentioned before, it was arranged as a joint project between J and Curtin Uni. We already mentioned that it was funded by FTF. So Phil already characterized the uh, NGSA survey, basically reminded uh, what it was. What should be stressed here that during NGSA, uh, samples were collected from two depths. Uh, basically, one sample was uh, superficial and another was collected from the depths of uh, 60 to 80 centimeters. And for the purpose of HMMA project, uh, we focused on the um, bottom deep uh, sediments because basically we wanted to get rid of any potential uh, uh, anthropogenic uh, impact or contamination. Finally, uh, the project focused on the cause grain fraction to avoid the uh, oiling components as much as possible. So basically the samples were dried and sieved to 75 to roughly 430 uh, microns grain size uh, fraction. Uh, separation was completed by dense uh, liquids using centrifugation and uh, uh, liquid nitrogen freezing. Uh, finally, the concentration was sprinkled on uh, 25 millimeter epoxy mounts with reference frames and attached uh, international geological sample number and QR code. Finally, they were polished and carbon coated and subjected to Tescan integrated mineral analyzer, uh, TIMA, automated mineralogy tool equipped with a number of uh, energy dispersive uh, detectors and uh, uh, with uh, scanning electron microscopy and uh, backscattered uh, scanning electron microscopy and detectors as well. So the minerals were identified using uh, comparing spectra to the library. It should be noted that the library was heavily customized, uh, so it was an iterative process uh, uh, based on the, the whole ecosystem of minerals that were revealed during the study. So the epoxy mounts, uh, we hope that they are going to be a resource for further studies as well, uh, with uh, further developing analytical methods. So each of the samples is characterized by this uh, QR code, and if you scan it, it will immediately bring you all metadata about the sample. Here is basically a picture of the uh, Tescan Tima uh, device itself. Plus, it shows you how the mineral mount looks like. It's one of these mineral panoramas with uh, classified uh, minerals. So basically, originally, we ran a pilot project looking just at uh, 10 samples across the country because we wanted uh, to check whether the project is actually feasible 
whether we can uh, have these heavy mineral separates, whether there would be uh, enough diversity in uh, the separates to compare the results with different geological uh, regions. And it was uh, quite successful in this regard. And also, when we started to look at this data, we started developing a, a special bespoke tool for analyzing the data, because we knew that actually that the amount of data would be enormous, and I will elaborate on that a little bit uh, further. So when it was demonstrated that it's actually feasible, uh, we started full-scale data acquisition based on uh, 1,315 uh, uh, NGSA uh, samples. It was decided that the data would be released uh, gradually in steps, uh, concurrent with other EFTF uh, project data releases. I guess the rationale was uh, uh, firstly to um, have a maximal impact as we go, and also to get the early feedback on the results. And so the original data release was for the DCD, the FTF, deep dive uh, region. Uh, so here you can see the distribution of uh, samples coming from approximately one million uh, square kilometers. And it actually had uh, quite immediate uh, uh, impact because there was uh, some uptake of uh, a tenement based on uh, uh, data for uh, heavy zinc minerals. So it's actually the first data release was in July uh, 22. Then we have another one for uh, Barclay Isa, Georgetown, Georgetown region in uh, November 22. Uh, again, from uh, roughly one million square kilometers. And finally, we had uh, a final data release approximately one year later in uh, last October. So that's basically the summary of the data that has been acquired. So basically the data came from 1,315 uh, bottom sediment samples from 1,186 uh, uh, catchments from the area of approximately 6 million square kilometers. It should be important to emphasize that the data come for 145 million individual grains for roughly 106, well, for 163 minerals. So the, actually the quantity of data is uh, absolutely staggering. So the question is how you analyze this data. So I guess originally we borrowed the idea from our American colleagues uh, whether we can adopt uh, network analysis tool for analyzing this huge data set. So basically, this type of tools are normally used for analyzing uh, your network connections, say, on a Facebook or Instagram or, well, spy network, if you're a member of one. Here is an example uh, devoted specifically for uh, Game of uh, Thrones. Uh, basically, the idea is that each dot or node represents uh, one of the major protagonists. Uh, the size of this node is actually proportional to the number of frames in which this hero appears in the show. I interaction between different peoples, uh, they're actually shown by these uh, links, and uh, the thickness or weight of the link is proportional to the number of interactions. So it basically gives you a very uh, quick uh, visual capture of what's uh, possible. Okay, so that's how we implemented it within the network analysis tool. And uh, I'll take a risk of uh, running it live. And nothing happens. <laughs> I wonder why. So anyway, so basically when you find the application, you're presented with a screen that actually have three areas. Uh, by default, we normally have uh, zinc minerals depicted. In this particular case, uh, it actually shows minerals associated with a rare metal mineralization. But the rationale is that actually you cannot show 145 million points for uh, 163 minerals. So you need to pre-filter your data somehow. And that's what the left panel is. So you can basically limit the number of your minerals based on your mineral classes. For example, you can look separately or together at uh, oxides, carbonides, or sulfides. 
you can filter your minerals by the chemical composition or by the group of chemical elements. In this case, rare metals stand for uh, molybdenum, tin, uh, tungsten, uh, tantalum, and tantalum and niobium. And uh, finally, you can actually uh, filter your elements, b minerals based on their progenetic uh, uh, associations. Also, you can add or assist this uh, filtering with uh, density or hardness. In this case, you actually have a compact group of uh, your selected minerals, uh, and you can explore relationship between them, and it serves you as a guide what you want to plot. So basically, there is a drop-down menu that will pick up minerals from the available analyzed data set, and you can show these minerals either separately or in combination with each other. There is a the whole number of uh, important uh, geological features that are related to uh, origin and distribution of uh, heavy minerals, including regional uh, uh, geology, topography, hydrography, and distribution of uh, mineral deposits. For example, in this particular case, we overlay distribution of columbite and tantalite over our topography and uh, bomb large-scale catchments. Uh, so we can actually see the relationship between uh, deposits and distribution of columbite and tantalite. Uh, here is an illustration how this data can uh, work in comparison or in competition with the regional geochemical data set. So Phil already showed the continental scale lithium map of Australia. Here it is shown again, but uh, now with the sampling data points removed to make it more uh, reasonable. And also we have uh, distribution of lithium deposits and uh, lithium mineral occurrences on uh, this map. And uh, as you can see, uh, correlation is not very uh, inspiring. If anything, it's rather negative than uh, positive. Especially if you look, for example, at the mm, local lithium background and green bushes, the main lithium deposit in Australia. To a large extent, it's related to the fact that um, lithium is very easily mobilized during the weathering process, easily travel through your landscape uh, in uh, ground waters and superficial waters, and then getting recaptured in uh, uh, a few, uh, sheet silicates and uh, clay uh, minerals. So as a result, you can have areas enriched in lithium pretty remote from their source areas. But if we look at the distribution of heavy minerals, uh, we can see actually a much uh, better correlation. So in this case, we, again, we are looking at uh, columbite and tantalite. Uh, that are good indicator minerals for LCT type of lithium uh, mineralization. And in most cases, uh, the correlation is pretty good. Uh, and also we have areas that are not very well characterized in terms of known lithium mineralization, but apparently have a potential, for example, like Aileron uh, uh, province. So now what are impacts up to date? So as Phil mentioned, we have uh, an uptake of 11 uh, tenements by four companies already. The first was a, uh, a junior company that actually grabbed the tenement in South Australia based on distribution of, of Gehnite. It's actually Link Spinel uh, that normally associated with uh, uh, metamorphic rocks and might be indicative of a BHT type of uh, mineralization. And uh, the rest of the, um, of the taken tenements, they are all associated with uh, uh, rare earth minerals. So we have a number of tenements in South Australia, Northern Territory, Queensland, and New South Wales. So we have uh, a few accolades from uh, former BHP exploration geologists uh, who actually do see uh, value in, in this type of data sets. Uh, there is a very interesting discussion on LinkedIn uh, run by John Anderson, uh, a private consultant who actually heavily uses both uh, NGSA, NAGS, and uh, heavy mineral data set uh, in his uh, data interpretation. And now we have some inquiries from uh, 
potential international partners uh, about application of this uh, methodology elsewhere. Just an example from uh, John Henderson, de facto LinkedIn blog. So if you are interested, you can visit and uh, uh, read about his uh, insights. It's actually pretty fascinating. And where could we go from here? Okay, so first of all, uh, the results of the project. We have a national scale uh, data set of uh, heavy minerals uh, for the whole continent. It's actually the first one in the world. Overall, there is nothing to compare it with. Uh, we develop a bespoke cloud-based uh, mineral network analysis tool to explore this data-rich asset. And we already demonstrated uh, the value uh, of this project to industry. There is some possible follow-up work. For example, it's uh, possible not to look just at mineral ident identification, but it's also possible to look at uh, mineral compositions. For example, uh, it is possible to map composition of gehnite and uh, garnets. It is possible to date some of heavy minerals, uh, for example, uh, uh, we are considering possibility of uranium lead dating of cassiterite, and it would be good to establish uh, its uh, exact provenance. And uh, as Phil already discussed, um, there is always a potential uh, to go for high density uh, surveys. In this case, probably you need to uh, tailor this uh, survey for a particular type of mineral system you are interested uh, in, so you don't need to go straight away for the whole country, but uh, you might be interested in a particular corner. And finally, here is uh, a number, first of all, a number of references for the key people and organizations who contributed. And finally, at the end of this presentation, there is a summary of uh, all uh, references uh, currently relevant for this particular project. And uh, at this moment, that's probably it from me and I will try uh, to get uh, to this M&A application while we are answering the questions. Thank you.